You're listening to the Inquisitive Red Podcast, the show that brings you philosophical ponderings of your life from a bird's eye view. Now, here's your host, Shah. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Inquisitive Run Podcast. I'm Shaw, your host. Thanks so much for joining me, and thank you to the new subscribers. It's much appreciated. Today's show is the second in a series on mediumship. And I'm going to be introducing or interviewing someone who's quite special. I met Ruthie Phillips at a uh, College of Psychic Studies workshop 20 years ago, it must have been, Um, I think, and I can't remember, we'll talk about it in the interview, you'll hear that, Uh, but it may have been, I wondered if it was about past life regression, I'm not sure, it may have been about attachments, I was writing a paper on attachments at the time. Uh, I'd have to really go back and, and think about it, she couldn't remember either. But I just wanted to say, because I'm, I'm about to introduce her, but um, Ruthie is very tuned in when it comes to all things mediumship, but also when it comes to living a better spiritual life, a, a better ascended life for yourself and for the planet, for the universe. And sometimes, and it's something we talked about after we stopped recording, we were talking about mediumship, and I just wanted to add this bit in because I told her I would add it in in the intro. You know, mediums can sometimes, because we, we have a personality as well as working with spirit, we're who we are. And sometimes it's not what you say, it's how you say it, it's how you deliver the message. And when you start to develop spiritually, you become more and more and more aware of the impact your words will have on someone. Words carry energy. And I'm not quite sure a lot of people acknowledge that. You know, there's an old saying, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I've never, even as a child, I could never resonate with that because words can hurt. Words carry energy with them. Uh, You only need to look at the ancients. You only need to look at incantations, chanting, all of those things. Words do carry energy. So I'm going to go into my formal introduction about Ruthie, but I wanted to add that in. So here we are. Ruth Phillips is renowned as one of Australia's leading clairvoyant mediums. She's also an advanced or soma color therapist, spiritual life path counselor, teacher, spiritual healer, feng shui practitioner, and past life therapist. Ruth is also taught at the College of Psychic Studies in London. She has been featured on a number of leading Australian TV and radio shows, including the TV show Sensing Murder, where a team of psychics help private investigators gather leads in Australia's unsolved murder cases. Ruth is regularly featured in print as well as online where she holds the Awaken Meetup. She continues to guide and help people develop in their spiritual practice. And she has a thriving private practice. And I'm so pleased to be speaking with her today. Welcome, Ruth Phillips. So, Ruthie, what was your first encounter of spiritualism? Well, when my family left England and we travelled and went to New Zealand, my grandfather was there. All my mother's family had gone to New Zealand. My grandfather was a very spiritual man, must have recognised something in me because I'd had all these experiences when I was little. I hadn't told anyone, but because he was psychic and spiritual. And in fact, his mother, my great-grandmother, and her parents were from the New Forest, where we were from in Bournemouth and uh, around the south of England. And they were on the Romany Register. And my great-grandmother used to um, sit in the back of, car- of a caravan and tell fortunes. And I learned that much later. However, my grandfather took me to the Spiritualist Church for the first time. I was 13. And we went and this amazing medium called Beatrice Swaby was on platform. And it was standing room only. And my grandfather and I were right at the back of the the church. And she came to him with a message uh, all about a single red rose in a bud vase, about a sweetheart of his before he'd met my grandmother. 
I was fascinated because I thought that's amazing detail. And he confirmed it with me when I tugged on his sleeve and said, is that right? And then I looked around the congregation and everyone's face was lit up with joy, joy at hearing from loved ones that they'd lost. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to bring that sort of joy and happiness to people. Well, duh, duh, careful what you ask for. Uh, little did I know I already had that gift within and on board, but it then came in later. And uh, as a sequel, just to that story, many years later, I went, I had lived in New Zealand for a couple of years when I went back after I'd gone to Australia. I went back to that same church and I was the medium on the platform and standing at the back of the church in spirit was my grandfather standing with Beatrice Swaby. So it was a perfect circle and perfect way of giving back and giving thanks. However, I digress. So uh, I moved to Australia. Uh, oh, that night I went home from my first um, meeting and all these people, something had opened and activated in me because I said, oh, I'm ready. That's what I want to do. So I lay down in bed and I had a semicircle of people and spirit all around me and I went, Oh, I was terrified. And I later found out they were my soul group. They were from spirit. They were my beautiful people who I love and communicate with all the time now. And uh, I shut my eyes and went out, you know, curled up small, went under my covers. So I could still see them with my covers over my head, my eyes closed. I was terrified, as I said, and ran into my mother and said, Mummy, there's people in my room. Help me. She said, just go back to sleep. No use whatsoever. And so I went back to my bed, but I actually asked them to go away because I was so frightened, which they did. And spirit will always do that. If they're loving and they're, they're with you and all that, they'll, they'll honour who you are. You, you don't have to be in their control, their beckoning control. Anyway, so um, as a teenager, I started reading things like life before life and life after life and life in between life and past lives and walk-ins and all sorts of things like that and lots of sci-fi things, and, and uh, I thought that was normal reading material for teenagers. I discovered later it wasn't. And then uh, moved to Australia uh, when I was 22 and went to a psychic fair in a shopping centre of all places. And there was a wonderful, exotic-looking woman then called Nicola, and she did a reading for me or she was laying out some cards and first thing she said to me is you're on the wrong side of the table you should be on this side of the table uh, and I said whatever do you mean and she said well you should be reading for me because that's your gift and I couldn't believe it and she said I want to invite you to my uh, meditation and development circle which I went along to and I attended for a few months and she put me after our meditation put me with another one of the girls there and just said, now, hold her watch and tell her what you what you think. I didn't even know at that stage what psychometry was, which is holding a piece of jewellery. And I started telling this lady things, and her eyes were just popping. And she's saying, yes, 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 like this. At that stage, I had no way of knowing how to interpret things, but I was just, just describing what I was seeing psychically, clairvoyantly. I didn't know I could do that. And then everything just opened up. I remember going in, home in the car one particular night. It must have been about second or third time. And I'm sitting at a set of traffic lights because it was quite a, a long drive home. And I felt this, this noise went crack. And this amazing thing happened in my forehead. And I, I realized that my third eye had just been kind of like blasted open. And then it all happened from there, really, um, and I just, I could just see everything and see into spirit. But I didn't realize even then I was a medium until I started talking to people and telling them about their granny who passed over and how she's talking about a piano or this or that or something. And, and they were going, yes, but she's dead. And I went, oh. And then I read in a book, this is what mediums do. And I went, oh, I must be a medium, you know, duh. So it, it sort of came on as a natural thing because it's in my family. Um, we're on the Romany Register in the New Forest and my great-grandmother, my grandfather's mother, uh, used to tell fortunes in the back of a caravan and I only learned that many years after I'd started. So developing as a medium is a different thing and it's, it's getting the runs on the board. It's about practice. It's about 
understanding the way that spirit talk to you and their messages and shorthand and what symbols and signs mean because you can describe people you can talk about things that you're seeing but the hard thing is the interpretation and sometimes the message is lost in the interpretation so yeah that's kind of how I got into it but lots and lots of readings for lots and lots of people that's the runs on the board are very important that is amazing. And what's interesting is you have had a career, you've had a career really in uh, the airlines and hospitality as well. So how were you, were you doing the mediumship alongside that? Uh, because a lot of people think that when you're a psychic medium, uh, spiritual medium, however you label yourself, people label themselves, um, that that's all you do. But many of us do other work. So yeah. Yeah. So can you talk about that a bit? Well, the deal with spirits, when I first started out, I was in sales and marketing. I was a sales rep and then a manager and then a national um, marketing manager for a big um, makeup company. And then I uh, wanted to go flying and uh, join uh, an airline. I joined Qantas. But the deal with between me and spirit was that I would do both and that I would be of service uh, service in the air and service to spirit. And so when, in my time off, I would see clients when I came home. And I also used to, as you know, used to run up to London. I used to do the l- regular London route a lot from Sydney. And I'd get off the plane and run down the road to the College of Psychic Studies and see clients there or run a workshop. And uh, so that's how it was integrated. But, you know, um, People think that mediums and psychics make a lot of money out of what they do. Actually, that's far from the truth. Yes, there are people who are out there who are very big, global, international people who do make a lot of money, but that doesn't last for long. I mean, I had two TV series in Australia in the early 2000s, and I've had radio shows and all sorts of things like that. But it's never been about the money. Spirit will always support me. But quite often it's the earthly job, or for me it was more the air job, um, and other things that have kept us going and kept me going. uh, And I do the spiritual work. Now, more recently, it's more full-time spirit, but I don't do it five days a week or seven days a week. I do monitor and I manage my energy and things like that. Mm -hmm. But my sense is that if people think they're going to make a lot of money out of spiritual work, then they really need to examine their motives for doing it. And it's it's actually, I signed up for a lifetime of healing service to the sentient beings of the planet. That's what I do. And every day I dedicate my work to the light, working in the light, for the light, and to be of service and to help as many people as I can. And that's what I'm here to do. Mm-hmm. But spirit supports me in so many ways and I'm given yeah, I'm just touching my ear because they're talking. They're talking to me. Uh, but spirits support me. They give me insights. They tell me when to jump, when to hold back, when to move, when the ducks are lined up, all of that sort of stuff. And that's what helps my husband and I make our decisions because I'm shown. I'm shown the path. And what greater gift can you have? And I'm surrounded by love. And that is the only thing I have to say that transmutes the third dimension into the spiritual dimension. It's love. You can't take anything else with you. Amazing. Yes. And speaking of which, your workshops, this is where I met you at the College of Psychic Studies. And That's right. I was thinking this morning, did I, I couldn't, can't remember if I did a past life or it may have been an attachment course. It was something we did over a weekend. Fantastic. Amazing. Oh, and then you. we became friends after that. And also, uh, you have always taught, well, you were teaching consistently at the college for, for quite a while. Yes. Um, but also alongside that, you were doing your private sitting. So yes. I know that you've worked a lot for spirit, with spirit, for other people's healing, progression, ascendance, however people want to label it. Um, and you know, you talk a bit about the psychicness or when you uh, knew you were a medium. I wanted to ask you, do you believe everybody's psychic 
do you believe everybody's a medium? Um, my view, I tend to think that most people are psychic. I believe everybody's psychic, but the jury is still out for me if everybody's a medium. I have got no evidence of that, but I'd love to hear your view on that. Sure. Well, I, I do believe that everyone has the ability to use their psychic gifts, and I believe that we all have them. Uh, and I equate it to swimming. We've all got the physiological capability of swimming or learning to swim. And some people are Olympic swimmers and some people sink like a stone. Some people paddle along like little doggies. But it depends on your environment, your genetics, your body build, all of that, the opportunity. You might live in the middle of nowhere where there's no water. But the, the, the whole thing with that is that we can, we can be um, better with our psychic abilities by training. And as I said before, it runs on the board. Mm. I had one lady who came to me, and this is a funny story. She came to me for a personal session. This is quite a number of years ago. And she said, I want to do what you're doing. I said, oh, that's good. I said, well, you have the gift. I said, now, how many clients have you seen? And she said, uh, three. I said, what, today already? And she said, no, no. I said, oh, this week. She said, no, this month, no, ever. And I went, okay, right. Well, perhaps when you've done 3,000, uh, let's talk more. But it's, uh, it's like wanting to run before you can walk. But you can develop your psychic ability and you can do that and strengthen it. It's like going to the gym and flexing a muscle. It gets stronger and it's trusting in the guidance. So every time you trust in your intuition, your gut instinct, mm -hmm. something that's being given to you, that gets stronger because you follow that and you get confirmation and then you strengthen your belief and your faith in yourself and your guidance. With mediumship, it's about tuning in to the other side and it's about shifting your frequency and your dimension because we're on the third dimension where we're vibrating quite slowly, whereas spirit is in fifth, sixth, seventh dimension and beyond and fourth, the more near realms of fourth. But in order to be able to communicate from here to the spiritual dimensions, a medium has to raise their vibrational frequency and spirit has to bring theirs down mm -hmm. to meet so that there's less of a gap in the middle. Mm -hmm. And it's not like they're there up there and we're down here or over there or whatever. We actually all coexist in the same moment, mm -hmm. uh, but we're vibrating at different frequencies. So I, I think about balls, you know, um, molecular balls and how they vibrate. When you put all these balls together, and if you try it with tennis balls or something, you see that there's a little diamond pattern where the balls don't meet. For me, the way to explain it is that I look through that gap in between the vibratory balls of the third dimension and look, look into the fifth. And that's where I see spirit. So, uh, but as far as whether people, all people can be meaningless, if your desire is there and you have a genetic code, I would say, as part of your lineage, that certainly helps. Uh, but what you have to do is open yourself up mm. to the higher frequencies and raise your frequency. And there's a great deal of discipline required. Mm. Definitely, yes. Yeah. Because I wondered about that. I know people have sat in circle for 12, 15, 14 years and I'm, I, I just wonder, well, when's it going to happen? But perhaps <laughs> that's me and my cynical mind. I, you know, but yes, yeah, so that's an interesting take. Yes, the concentration, the dedication and the lineage, which is an interesting aspect because a lot of mediums do talk about having a great, great uh, grandmother or skipping a generation or whatever. Yes. Certainly that's the case for me as well. Interesting stuff. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. Now, I know nature plays a huge part in your life. You are such a nature buff. Why is it that, for our listeners here, why is it that it's essential for us to tap into nature, especially if we're doing spiritual work oh it's absolutely vital actually because 
it's your connection to the divine. I mean, everything outside, everything in nature is created by the divine and it has the most beautiful energy and frequency. But often when we're dealing with people, well, first we have to maintain a lot of spiritual cleanliness and clean our energy and our energy fields, our physical energy field. I'm a two shower a day girl. You know, I just, when I've been with clients all day, Mm -hmm. I go straight to the shower before I even prepare my evening meal. But one of the things that I love to do, and I often, well, I always do before I start my day, is I go out into my garden and stand barefoot on my grass. And I go and talk to my plants as well. But barefoot on the grass, I'm grounding my energy in. I'm aligning myself with Gaia, Mother Earth, and connecting into my Earth Star Chakra, which is deep within the Earth. And what that does is that brings us into a centeredness. It aligns us, it grounds us, and it clears out our energy fields as well. I also go around and commune with uh, the nature spirits, with all my plants, all the flower fairies. I applaud everyone. I go and say, you're looking beautiful today. Well done. Thank you very much. Lovely, good work. Keep going. Stuff like that. I talk to them all the time. Talk to the birds. And I often walk in nature as well. But that's just my garden, which I'm very blessed to have a lovely garden. Mm -hmm. But you have a lovely garden because you talk to it and you thank it and you care for it. Before you pick anything, you do it with reverence. And you ask, you know, when I go and pick my herbs, I've got 29 herbs growing in my garden. And I tune into which ones I need to have for the meal or whatever I'm going to be doing. And um, I go and say, may I have some, please? And... Uh, thank them and thank for the bounty and all of that sort of thing and I think it's very important to be connected to nature because it's the single most important healing that we have that that the divine has given us Mm. so that's very important for me to be in that space so I'm actually studying herbalism at the moment and want to add that to part of what I do Mm -hmm. I do a lot with herbs a lot with the vegetables Mm -hmm. and fruits and things that we grow here my husband's got green thumbs and he never knew he did but he's very good and uh, I'm just my herbs just grow into thickets you know it's just amazing (laughs) I'm very lucky but uh yeah, so it's sort of like finned horn in Bath, if you know what I mean. So <laughs> it's um, it's beautiful, but I love nature and I do a lot of foraging as well. So I've just got, um, gone into high production of elderflower cordial. And when it's autumn, we do blackberries and we have them coming out of our ears. So lots of things, lots of things with that. Fantastic. It does change your energy uh, once you've been out. And if you're ever stressed, take a walk and something magical happens. Even if you're in the city and it's all concrete, something magical does happen. I want to just go back to what you were saying before about when you were saying, well, I heard this and I saw that. And of course, what we're talking about is clairvoyance and clairaudience. Why do you think that some of us have all the clairs, as they say, and then some mediums only maybe be clairsentient, clairaudient? What's that all about? Well, I, you know, my my sight is the the one that I, you know, my my vision, my clairvoyance is the one that predominates for me, and um, I do have a bit of clairaudience. I can hear certain things, uh, but the vision is the strongest one for me. Uh, I often joke that I haven't got. Um, a good sense of first smell here on earth because I've got second sight, <laughs> <laughs> but I actually have a very good um, clair, clair sentience or um, there is a word for it, for um, keen smelling, smell it. I can't think what it is. It's... Anyway, I'll tell a story about the, the smell later oh. because it was really quite a funny story. But um, I think that we go where our strongest physical sight, um, our strongest physical sense is, like for me, it's my sight, it's a natural overflow for that to be my strongest spiritual sense. And you'll find that some people are very good on that level. Some people's hearing is very acute, so they could could find that it's their clear audience that is the thing that's the strongest for them. Or they're very good at touch or understanding sensation or the need for healing and can put their hands on someone and know where to go straight away. And that's clear sentience. But it's a sensing of the room as well and how that feels. So some people will get shudders come over them when they're getting um, confirmation from spirit. That is clairsentience. So a lot of people do have that. That's quite um, quite important. 
Uh, so I, I, I'm not quite sure why some people have them all and some have only one, but I think it, there is an opportunity to develop that and by focusing on it. So I think that we can enlarge our repertoire more and more. And Spirit played the, um, not the joke, but gave me an opportunity to learn that I can smell things out spiritually, whereas my physical sense is not so good. So it's, it's really interesting. Um, have we got time for me to tell you that little story? Oh, yes, story? Please. Oh, yes yeah. please. All right. Well, my husband and I, when we first came to England to live, he had to have a visa and there was some confusion and he did have the right visa, but we went to see a, um, uh, an immigration specialist. Well, I use that term in inverted commas. So we went to this chap's house and he was in this village in the middle of nowhere uh, in Wiltshire. And we went in and it looked a bit, I'm always, I'm always thinking about how people manage their spaces because mm -hmm. if the space is disorganized or untidy or just looks a bit thingy, unkept, I kind of go, oh, that's a bit of a reflection of their mind perhaps or their personality trying not to judge, but it does reflect a little. So I thought, oh, no, that's all right. So we were shown into the sitting room by his wife. And there was, um, it was, it was lovely. It was fine. And we sat down and I couldn't be, put, bring myself to sit back in the seat. I sat right on the edge of the, the sofa thinking that we're going to have to get up and go to another room. But he came in to see us in this sitting room. And before he came in, though, my husband and I were sitting there quietly and I had the most overwhelming, disgusting smell in the room. And just then, the gentleman came in to talk to us and he was saying everything contrary to what we knew it was like my husband was an overstayer he was an illegal immigrant he was this he was that and we were in complete shock and we left and went back to where we were living and I said I really think we need a second opinion so we got one and it wasn't till about a week later and we came back after the second opinion and everything was all right and nothing was wrong and nothing was illegal and we went oh thank goodness for that we were sitting outside in the summer and having a, a cool drink and I said well I should have known when when we smelled that dreadful smell in that man's first place and my husband said what smell and he's got a very keen sense of smell and I said, that smell, it smelt like a dead rat. It smelt like a, a rat had crawled under the sofa and died. And he said, I smelt nothing. And then I realized it was spirit telling me that I was smelling a rat. I was smelling a rat with this person. I've never forgotten that. So now when I smell something that's overwhelming for me, I always check with my husband. I say, can you smell that? He goes, no. I go, oh, I can spirit. Oh, this is not good. Or this is good. So it's really interesting because I don't have that smell thing. I have to check use by dates in the fridge or get my husband to smell it. So when I do smell something, I know it's spirit now. So it's it's very interesting how they work. And I was very, I mean, it was a hard way to learn that lesson, but goodness me, that's a good lesson to learn. Incredible. Absolutely. And actually, you know, one of the questions I was going to ask you was, how do you receive your information from spirit? It's probably one of the most popular questions I tend to get. Well, how does it ha actually happen? But you're actually explaining it as we go along. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, you hear, you see, you sense, you smell at times. So all of this is helpful. We, we had an incident um, in Sydney where they had an open day at the local police station and myself and the lady who lived across the hall from me, in the place that we were renting, she had a child the same age as my daughter and they were both only four or five at this stage. We're going on with this tour and then we went into the, the prison and, and went and I just didn't even think about it because it was on this sort of round the village tour kind of thing. And we got in there and the kids started going, eh, eh. I went, mean, oh, my Lord, and got us all out of there in a nanosecond because the children were very, very, um, you know, psychic and, and my neighbour was as well. And I, well, of course I was, but we were all so sensitive and we just blundered into this. And I went, oh, for goodness sake. So I got us all out and cleared us all and did all that. But, gosh, you, you've just got to be mindful and just, just be aware. 
But I had a client at one stage come to see me when I was in Sydney. And uh, she came in her prison uniform. Um, she was a prison guard, not a prisoner, but a prison guard. And, you know, hats off to them that can work in that environment. I'm, you know, I'm in awe. And, but she, I, and I had to go, oh, my Lord. So I had to put lots of stuff around us, some colour therapy and all that sort of clearing things. And I said to her, now, please tell me, when you go home, you're going to get your uniform off and put it in the wash and shower yourself before you cook your dinner and eat it. And she said, oh, I don't normally. And I went, what? So people don't understand that you carry that energy with you. And it doesn't matter whether you work in a prison or you work in a, a dress shop or you work in a dentist's or wherever you are. At the end of the day, you've been if you've been surrounded by people, even online, doing a lot of stuff online with people, you've got to clear your energy and put on some at-home clothes or shift the energy, wash yourself and do that before you make food and ingest it. Otherwise, you're ingesting it and certainly not go to bed and sleep in it because that's all around your aura. People don't get it. They think no. I'm just being clean for the sake of being obsessive. But it's not that. It's like keeping your energy clean. Otherwise, how do you rest? How do you regenerate? Absolutely. That, and funnily enough, that's something you taught me, actually, years and years ago. That is something oh, yeah. you taught me. Oh, yes, definitely about the clothes and about something about people. And it was really, yeah, I won't go into it. But yes, you, you showed that to me. And it helped throughout my practice, everything oh, I do. Great. With, without a doubt I think there's I, one, one other thing too yes, just to interrupt yes. a lot of people you know where you have split families and you have the mm. children go off to dad mm -hmm. for the weekend and then they come back and they're acting up and they're playing up and all of that sort of stuff the first thing you've got to do is get those the kids into the bath or into the shower clear their energy, mm -hmm. then give them their supper and then they can go to bed mm -hmm. if they're coming home for dinner. And if they've been to school straight after leaving the other one, if the energy's a bit tricky, I'm not saying it's all dads, it could be the other way around. Please don't think I'm judging. But it's like if there's a disruption, if the children are upset, and it could just be they've been somewhere, they've been on a school trip or an outing or something, my daughter knows the first thing I'm going to say is have a shower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. before anything so and it's a joke in our family because she says I've had a shower I've had something <laughs> nice <and> nice to eat. <laughs> yeah. so it's it you know I think it's really important to understand that energy sticks in our auric field mm -hmm. and when you're a medium you have to be so clear you have to have your energy clear Otherwise, what you're doing is you're picking up. I clear in between every client. Mm -hmm. I spray my room, I smudge, I do all of that to clear my energy, mm -hmm. clear the room energy as well. Mm -hmm. So, Absolutely right. Yes. Now, we're going to go philosophical just for a few moments. Okay. So if you could, let's see, have dinner, lunch, brunch with three people, living oh. or dead. Oh, my goodness. Who would they be? And why? Oh, oh well, Saint Germain, mm. Jesus. Mm. Where's the other one? Well, I would have said Merlin, but Saint Germain, I mean, Merlin is an incarnation of Saint Germain. So I'm just maybe um, the Magdalene. Mm, okay. And why? Why those three? Well, Saint Germain, the master of the violet ray, walking the pathways of the highest order and lifetime of healing service to the planet. Uh, had many, many incarnations, uh, very much about the ascension process. Mm. And you see, I throw in there Archangel Michael and a few others as mm. well, so I could, I'd have a really nice team. Mm. And um, But uh, mainly because of that's my, my, my auric field, my colour, my colour ray, the violet ray. Mm -hmm. And like yourself, um, those of us who are in service and who are spiritually aligned and giving from that space, we are called the violet robes. Mm -hmm. And we operate under the Saint Germain. And Saint Germain has, like the cloak of invisibility in Harry Potter, um, uh, shifts energy and is very good on that level. So if you don't want to be seen, you call on Saint Germain to put his cloak around you. Um, and there have been instances I've done that, which has been very handy. Uh, so, yes, and he's had 
one of his major incarnations was as the wonder man of Europe. Mm. And uh, so I want to talk to him about that because he lived for about 300 years in that incarnation. And I want to understand what it is that fed him in that, that time because he wasn't ever seen to eat, but he had some substance that he ingested. And even his coachman lived for a couple of hundred years. So uh, that's one person. And of course, he had other incarnations as Francis Bacon and Merlin of Britain and uh, a few others, so as well as the Wonder Man. So quite an interesting character. Uh, Jesus, because I'd like to have a big chat to him about what really happened. Mm. And uh, did he die on the cross? Did he not die on the cross? You know, what's the real story? Where are the lost um, Gospels? Mm -hmm. And uh, and have the Magdalene with him because I believe that they were married. So, you know, that might go against a lot of what other people believe in. But anyway, and find out whether she did indeed go to the south of France and all that sort of stuff. So I, I really like to have a big chat. But also, um, as Lord Sananda, Jesus mm -hmm. uh, does a lot of healing. So I want to understand a little bit more about the healing processes with him and um, part, his, his role in the ascension that we're going through and uh, how he's leading that. So I really like to talk to him about that. And the Magdalene is keying into the feminine energy, the rose feminine energy associated with Lady Nada and Archangel Gabriel and uh, Our Lady Mary and all of that sort of thing. So I'd like to talk about the feminine aspect of things as well. Yes, very interesting. Then I'd love to be a fly on the wall for that. Oh, well, you'd be invited if we're having oh. them. <laughs> Wonderful. I was going to say, do I have to reincarnate as a fly? Maybe I've already been. <laughs> um, right. So what's one of the most important things that you've learned from your work as a medium? Oh, gosh, that's an interesting question. I think it's trust. I think if I had to put one thing is trust. Trust in my guidance, trust in spirit, trust in the divine, more trust in the divine because those in spirit, you know, they have got a sense of humour and stuff like that, but also know that I, I'm not alone. I do know that and I trust in that so very much and I trust in the process and that they will always look after me and protect me and that I'm, I'm guided. That's my thing. Mm. And that there is so much love around. Yes, there is indeed. And I want to ask a bit about something that is talked about a lot. I recently saw a program and I talked about this on one of my, when I was introducing this segment on my podcast, the idea of skeptics. So I recently, uh, you know, it's funny how spirit bring these things to me. I was just, you know, you turn on YouTube and you get all the recommendations and there it was first recommendation. I can't remember the exact uh, thumbnail, but it was something about scams and mediumship or medium scams or Ponzi schemes. Or, and then they dumped mediumship in. I thought, well, let me listen to this. <laughs> and um, it was somebody who was trying to force a very well-known young medium who's on TV trying to force him to give him a reading. And the young medium was saying, no, I, I refuse to do it, which I, I don't blame him. When I looked at the person's energy, there's no way. Um, but why do you think that some people are so insistent that this doesn't exist, that everything they know is real and true, that if it's not scientific, well, that that's still debatable. It's not scientific. I believe it is. But they're saying, well, if it's not proven scientifically, that means it doesn't exist. Why is it? Because we're all skeptical. You know, I'm, I'm still skeptical about life and everything else. So I think that's a healthy thing, skepticism. But why is it that mediumship, psychic abilities are constantly trying to be debunked. Well, it's the patriarchal system, isn't it? And there's a lot of power and there's a lot of truth in it. So if you look at many things that have um, ancient belief systems, I mean, uh, the astrologers of today used to be the astronomers of years gone by and they were highly revered. And the 
see is look at how many how long you had to wait to go and see the the Delphi of Oracle and um, the Oracle of Delphi, should I say? I mean, mm-hmm. all the the great names of the time queued up to see the Oracle of Delphi, and it's been it's since I believe since the Council of Nicaea mm. that. Uh, King Constantine or Emperor Constantine ruled over where 300 odd books from the Bible were eliminated and the the seers were eliminated and the past lives were eliminated and this was eliminated and that was eliminated to fit with the patriarchal view of the world. And that's part of it. And then it's been uh, promoted as something to fear. And this is what it is. It's not, it's not just... Um, skepticism it's actual fear fear of the unknown Mm. and if you know that it's you know what it's about and if you understand and you get into it and you understand how it all works it's not necromancy it's not you know witchcraft it's nothing like that but people have been trained to fear it until they learn otherwise and there are only two emotions and that's love and fear everything else stems from either of those And so for me, the scepticisms are fear. And another late medium who was a friend of mine in Australia always used to say, for those that believe, no proof is necessary. And for those that don't, no proof is ever enough. I love that. So succinct and 100% true. Absolutely. I wondered, I always wondered too, if some of it is the issue, and this is probably my, my training, my background, but we look a lot at uh, envy, jealousy, and I think that there's something very human about the skepticism. I think that sometimes people cannot accept that perhaps some people can appear to be able to do things that other people find not able to do. And I don't, I think media, I think the spiritual world can be very, yes, woo woo, but also very kind, very nice. And I come in and say, hang on, I think they're just envious. I think they're just jealous. Sometimes people are just jealous. (laughs) Well, I think that there is that aspect, but that's fear as well. That comes down to fear because they don't have something. They're fearful that they don't have something that someone else has. So, yeah, that greed, that fear, um, that not wanting to be someone better, but that's not being happy in yourself anyway. And the thing is that anyone who is sceptical, who wants to have that gift, they can can work on it themselves. I mean, you know as well as I do that you have to work at your art. You have to work at your mastery. You don't become a master medium in a minute. I've been doing this work for over 35 years, and I'm still not fab, you know, not, fabulous i'm not an ascended master i'm still human i still make mistakes in my interpretation yeah but you know that's okay i get it and i go oh i understand i understand how i read that instead of explaining what i was seeing i interpreted it so i think that people who are jealous and who there's plenty of room for us all that's the thing we could all every single one of us and in the golden age of atlantis that we're going into in the 5D world, in years to come, we'll all have that gift. Mm. Mm-hmm. And that's it's going to be na- a natural thing, like knowing how to swim or blowing our nose. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, email us at inquire at theinquisitiverin.com. That's E-N-Q-U-I-R-E at theinquisitiverin.com. Be sure to check all social media, especially the Facebook page, for new topics being discussed. And if you can contribute, please let us know so you can be a guest on the show. Now, back to the show. Yes, exactly. What are your thoughts about why we are given certain information and why we're not? So, for instance, people are saying, well, why didn't psychics tell us about the pandemic? Or why somebody once emailed and said, you know, I was ill. I saw a few mediums and none of them told me I was ill. Why is it that that tends to happen? Well, it's quite interesting because you'd have to. 
see for me i i get i get certain things certain sense of things coming up and what's happening on a global level and sense of things but that's when i'm dealing with people who might ask me a question about their life and then i'm given an insight or a broader view of the the way ahead on a global level so i'm learning too and so it's not like I go in and go, okay, so can you give me a three-month forecast, please, everyone? I don't do that because it can change moment mm -hmm. by moment. And this is the thing. And, and so if you, if you have a client in front of you who's come for a reading and say it was February 2020, and although I, that's actually something that's interesting, but say it was February 2020 and they're having a reading and – they wanted to know if they were going to be going on holiday that year. Uh, and I'd said, oh, no, I don't see that. Uh, I'm seeing you staying put in England. Um, I wouldn't necessarily have asked why, or I might not have been shown why. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? Absolutely. But it would be more like specific to their situation. Right. But it's interesting because in February 2020, uh, we were planning the next month to go to uh, Australia for a holiday. And I just woke up in the middle of the night one night and I said to my husband, we have to cancel our trip. We can't go. We'll be stuck. And uh, and then a couple of weeks later, all hell broke loose. It did. And so it was a wise decision. Yeah. Uh, but it was one that spirit gave me. Yeah. But it was it was a personalised thing. So if we hadn't been planning to go away in the March, I might not have had that message. Right. 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 So it's all dependent on timing. It depends on who you're seeing, who you're reading for and things mm. like that. Yeah. I mean, a lot of them, some of the things that I learn through other people's readings are fascinating. I get a lot of grannies come through talking to their granddaughters mm. and grandsons and things mm. like that. And I get a lot of people because I love cooking and food. Mm. A lot of them come through and, and talk about food that they've made that is significant to the person I'm reading for. And I had one Italian grandmother come through and she was just delightful, Nonna. And uh, she was talking about her sasa recipe. And I was talking to her telepathically saying, oh, yes, I know about the sugar in, in, in a tomato sauce recipe. She said, oh, no, 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 you must tell her the other secret ingredient. And I go, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it turns out that you've just got to put one anchovy in uh, tomato sauce. I never knew that. And I went, that's what I'm going to do from now on. But I told this to um, the girl I was reading for. She went, oh, my goodness, that's amazing. I didn't know that either. I said, well, we, we're going to be cooking your Nana Sessa from now on. But it was really interesting. So they tell me secret ingredients yeah. to things yeah. and stuff like that. But a lot of clients actually ask me if they've got an elderly or failing relative or got someone who has a life-threatening um, disease, mm -hmm. you know, how much longer they've got. And I go, actually, that's above my pay grade. Mm -hmm. That's actually a head office question and I'm at general <laughs> manager level. <laughs> because I'm never given date of death ever. Yeah. And I don't want to know and, nor, and, and and I don't want to know because if I knew and I don't want to have to not, you know, to mm -hmm. say because it's not up to me. It's a, it's a soul contract that that soul was made with God. It's not for me to intrude on that level yes sometimes uh i find you can be speaking to someone and spirit will say oh the granny's here and the person will say she's still here but she's on her last days <laughs> so oh, yeah. that can be difficult i'm sure that may have happened to you as oh, well yeah, lots. yeah it's one of those things there and but at least the person knows that they're about to pass so you well, not yes but also that shows that the truth transition has begun absolutely and uh it's it's they've got one foot either side mm, yeah and, and that yeah. often happens if someone's got dementia or parkinson's mm -hmm. as they fade out so they might be here 90 percent of the time and 10 percent in spirit and then it becomes you know 80 20 60 40 50 50 and then when you get down to 30 percent here and 70 percent you know that that transition is well underway and they're living more of their life in spirit than they are in the physical, although the, the body is still continuing on. Yes. And uh, so it's it's an interesting process. So yes, very interesting. It is a process. Yeah. It is a process, indeed. Ruthie, this has been incredible. I, it's the first time we've had, although I was I had the pleasure of being on your podcast, 
Funnily enough, listeners, viewers, Ruthie has had a podcast herself in the past. I it's been how long? Ten? Oh gosh, it would be. You were one of the first. 15, 18 years ago, perhaps. Yeah. One of the first. It's still on my website. Um, oh, bless. And it, you were one of the first people doing podcasting before podcasting was a thing, as the young people say. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm doing once a month things now. What oh. I've done is um, because we're, we've been through COVID and for the last 18 months or so, uh, I've wanted to bring people together to give them support at this time because a lot of people were mm. in lockdown mm. here, of course, and in Australia and all over the world. So I've got together a group called Awaken, the Awaken community. And uh, it's called awaken.ruthiephillips.com is the uh, website. And I'm sure you'll probably put it in. Yes, I will indeed. But once a month we join together and you can either join live or you can get the recording only. And what we do is we uh, have a spiritual development topic and then we have a meditation. Lasts for about an hour and a half all up. Uh, but we have inter- inter- exchanges and interchanges with people. Uh, we have a blessing. We have a grounding. We do all of that sort of stuff. I've started doing what's in the casket and get people to tune in mm-hmm. and uh, focus on what, uh, what what's in this special casket that I've got. And it's interesting. Uh, but now what we're doing, and as I move the focus away from me doing the teaching all the time and everyone's sitting there passively, you know, just listening, uh, I've now, we have a lot of gifts and skills in our whole group so for the next one that we're doing on the 22nd one day after the solstice on the 22nd of june uh that's going to be at 11 a.m london time which will be 8 p.m in sydney and uh if you go to my uh, website you can go and register for it and find out what time it is in your zone because we have people all over the world but what we're going to do in that one for the first time is i've got five people who are going to speak for five minutes about themselves and tell everyone what they do because we've got a wealth of abilities and gifts and talents and skills, skill sets that are amazing. And already we found that there's someone in Sydney doing the same as someone who's in the Netherlands, both doing a regreening and a community thing of gardens and things like that. And they didn't know. Uh, yet they're on opposite sides of the world. So now they've connected and they're talking to each other and exchanging ideas. And that's what we're doing. So it's an awakened community helping us through the awakening and ascension process, but also connecting people. So we're becoming a village and showing what we have to bring to the fireside of the village. That is amazing. Yes, I was going to ask you about your next. So viewers, listeners, I will put all the links in the show notes so you can go to that. But this is great coming up on the 22nd. So guys, please sign up, go and get that. Also, what else is happening? Anything else to uh, viewers can look forward to? Uh, Yeah, well, we've got the solstice coming up, which is going to be quite a powerful gateway, I think. And I have a a very lovely spiritual friend who I've known for 30 years who's actually going to be staying with me then. And we're deciding whether we'll go to Glastonbury or Stonehenge. I think it'll be Glastonbury this year. And uh, One of your favourite places. I know. So we're going to go and do that. Um, Yeah, there's some really interesting astrological stuff going on at the moment as well. And I think it's worth looking at that. Uh, there's lots of lots of change coming up. What I'm getting psychically is that by the time we get to Christmas, we'll be in a world that we just do not recognise. Mm-hmm. There's so much going on. And I feel that people are finding where home is as well. Mm-hmm. All of next year is going to be a time of great movement. Uh, we're going to be in a seven uh, numerological year next year. So that's a time of karma, but it's also about walking the pathways of the highest order. That's the seven is the violet energy of St. Germain, uh, because uh, 2023 adds to a seven. So that's, yes. that's why it's a global year for those that don't understand that. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of stuff happening, but I think by the end of 2023, people will be going through things. And one of the things that I would say, and why I'm really connected to nature and growing a lot, is start growing things for yourself. Mm-hmm. Start becoming independent. Yeah. Start, even if you're doing micro herbs on, on the windowsill in your kitchen, start to do things where you can give yourself some extra food, some extra green and chlorophyll and light and things like that. Because 
I think that things are going to go through. It's going to get a little worse before it gets better, mm. but it will get better. And when it is, I feel that it's we're just going to be in a shining golden time. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. And one of the things I was going to ask you, because we're, we're winding down, but what is your best tip for everyone to live a better life? Oh, <laughs> well, you know, turn your TV off. That's my tip. Because during the pandemic, if you had your TV on, uh, we were going through a global pandemic. If you didn't, it was Wednesday. Right. <laughs> simply right. put, yeah, simply put. Yeah. So uh, turn your TV off. Stop watching the news. Stop tuning in to the global narrative. Get out in nature. Mm. Enjoy your life. Live your best life ever. Live, do what you can that gives you joy. If you're in a job that doesn't give you joy, find something. Retrain. Go and do something else. Stay in the job until you've retrained, but find something else that you be passionate. Don't waste all your life doing something that you don't like. When I was 15, I stood in my bedroom in my parents' home and I said, not for me, the ordinary life. I want a magical life. I want things to be amazing. Well, they have been. I ordained that at 15 and it has been so all my life. So if you want a magical life, you can make it so. You don't have to depend on anyone else to make it for you. Mm. Live your best life. Be the example to others. Because the more you raise your frequency, the more you live your best life, the higher your energetic vibration is, the more that raises that of the planet and we all come up together. Fantastic. Even as you're speaking, the vibration is raising. Um, and listeners, I'm sure you can feel it through the screen. I mean, now we've come to the end where we put a fork in it, as I call it, far out random question. So I've got okay. a little bowl here. Oh, you can't see it. Maybe you can. I'm just going to pick one. Okay. It really is random as well. Okay. So what was an experience you didn't think much about at the time, but it ultimately made you a stronger person? Oh, gosh. I think for me, uh, the experience that I had when I had my daughter um, was amazing. I didn't uh, realise at the time because I was shielded by spirit that I'd passed over. I was de defibrillated three times and I ended up in uh, emergency for three days uh, in uh, quite a state. And it wasn't until a year later when I asked to be shown what had occurred that I learnt that I had to do a deal with spirit. And that was fine. But I was given the grace to be allowed to do the deal, which was really interesting because when I passed over, uh, I was there with my baby that I'd given birth to and I asked how she was and she was all right. And they said, well, you've got to go back. And I said, oh, that's good. I'll take her. And they said, no, no, she's going to stay with us. And I go, well, I'm sorry, I'm not going back. They go, no, 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 you've got to go back. And I go, no, well, I am not going without her. I'm not going without her. That's it. End of story. And so we had this, I argued with God, essentially, and they said, oh, but it'll be very hard and this and all that and, you know, all that sort of thing. And I go, okay, I don't care how hard it's going to be. I'm not going back without her. So it has been hard and it was hard. It's not hard now. It is hard because we're separated and we haven't been able to get together for a couple of years, but thank goodness for FaceTime and stuff like that. But it was hard when she was little. Uh, for various reasons, but emotionally, not because of her, but because of circumstances. And it made me very strong. Um, not, I didn't know at the time because I was being shielded, but mm. then knowing that really made me very strong because I knew that I'd made a choice and that mm. choice came with consequences. Mm. However, I know it was the right choice and it hasn't stopped me doing my work and that was the thing. So... I think it's made me more compassionate as well in the process. 
Mm, what an incredible story, which I'm hearing for the first time. So that was very interesting. And I have met her. She's lovely. Yes. Um, thank you, Ruthie. This has been incredible, as always. I always learn so much from you. And thank you, darling. It's been an honor. I'm grateful for all your teachings. And if anybody wants to know more information, all the links will be in the show notes. Also, you're still giving readings. You still yes, people I can still look. Am. Yeah, I'm still here in Bath. If anyone in the UK wants to come and see me, uh, but I do Zoom uh, Zoom readings as well, and I record them and send them to you afterwards. So uh, you can always email me at uh, info at ruthiephillips.com or ruth at ruthiephillips.co.uk. Perfect. And viewers, her readings are incredible. That's what I'll say. Thank so you, please go and get one. Uh, thank you once again. Right. It's been fantastic. And My I pleasure you. and honor. Thank you, darling. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms. Leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss. See you next time.